they were at my home. So I am not going to be as official. <laughs> Have heard this joke? It was told to me. It's, uh, it's a joke about you. <laughs> it's a joke about an amazing sound. So if you have heard it, uh, keep quiet. <laughs> traveling in a car, and the car broke down. And as the car broke down, the person came out of the vehicle looking for some help. It was late at night, and there was a monastery where there were monks. He went to ask monks for the help, and monks were very happy to help him. They uh, fixed his car, they fed him, and they even let him spend the night. And so I, at night, while he was sleeping, he was woken up by a sound, magical, divine, sounding sound. And he was really, really intrigued to know the source of the sound. In the morning, <coughs> once having <spending> breakfast, <laughs> and after breakfast, he asked the monks, you need more volume? Everything's good? Good. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> he asked about the source of the sound, and the monks told him that they uh, couldn't reveal the source of the sound because he was not a monk. Only monks could know about the sound. And he was uh, not very happy about that, but anyhow, that was the deal. So he went on. About a year later, he was driving in his car, and the car broke down, again, in front of the same monastery. So he went out to seek help from the monks, and the monks fed him, fixed his car, and let him spend the night. And again, he heard this amazing sound. And now he really, really needed to know what the source of the sound was. And when he asked the monks, to show him the source of the sound, they said that only monks could um, be shown the source of the sound. And he agreed to become a monk. Of course, first he asked, what does it take to be a monk? And they told him several things. You have to be celibate for 10 years. You have to memorize the Bhagavad Gita. You have to master the breast. You have to do yoga, varieties of things, and you have to count the particles of sand on the temple property. <laughs> and so some 15 years later, finally he managed to do all of this. And he reported that there was five trillion, oh, excuse me, 500 trillion, 336 billion, etc., etc., particles of sand. And they told him, very good, now you can know the source of the sound. So they showed him to a basement. And the, they took him to the basement, they uh, pointed out to a, a door. Behind that door is the source of the sound. And he went to open the door, and the door was locked. <laughs> Ha, 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 very funny, he said. Give me the key. <laughs> I waited all these years. So they gave him the key. And when he opened the door, there was another door. <laughs> uh, this time it was a wooden door. 
And then behind the wooden door, there was a metal door, and behind the metal, and like this, there was door after door after door. And finally, the head monk tells him, that's the last door, and here's the key. Takes the key, he opens the door, and there was the amazing source of the amazing sound. But I cannot tell you, none of you are monks. <laughs> <laughs> So in those days, I was very small, very young, and there were people who were kids that were much bigger than me and older than me, and the way it works, you, you pay in order to play. And then not only that you play, but you also have to put a bet. I don't advise anyone here to be able to That's what was going on back then, and it's still unfortunately going on. And very quickly, I lost all of the money. Basically, I was cheated. All these guys were much bigger than me, and I was cheated. And I cannot tell you how helpless and rotten I felt that my mother gave me, my mother trusted me. She gave me some money. And I went and I squandered it. And I felt completely rotten. Now, usually, when I felt bad as a child, I would go to my mother, bury my head into her lap, and all the worries of this world would cease. But this time, this worry would not go away. Even though the mother was there, her embrace was there, her sweet, Soothing words were there, but the rotten feeling was not going away. So much so that <coughs> even now I remember it. <laughs> Forty years later, I still remember it. It was so intense. Now, another incident, some years later, I grew up a bit, still a boy. And uh, here's another element from the Western life that <coughs> typically people of India fortunately don't have to experience. And that is divorce of the parents. My parents unfortunately divorced when I was quite young. And I lived with my mother. And so in the street, there was a lot of children who were all playing in the street. And on the one side of the street, there were buildings, and on the other. And in the windows of these buildings were the parents of all of the children. This is all about Bhagavad Gita. It may not seem like it, but... <laughs> <laughs> Just wait. <laughs> you don't have to wait 15 years, just 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. There were parents in all of these windows, and they were looking down at their children, and just enjoying looking at the children playing. And then in one point, there was this one boy that was much bigger and wider than me. And it started to terrorize me. And then again, I turned towards my mother. And I looked up to the window, 
and I was expecting that my mother would just tell this boy to back off. And then, being ordered by an adult, it would cease to harass me. But what happened was that the father of this boy was an interesting person, to put it politely. And he was making signs of threat towards me and towards my mother. So that my mother was now standing in the window, watching her child. He didn't kill me, he didn't draw blood or anything, but he was abusing me. And so there was this woman, my mother, looking at her child, being abused. And she did not dare to do anything else, so that the situation would not escalate. And I could see this helplessness in her arms. <coughs> she, felt, she felt helpless. Now, first, I felt helpless and rotten when I squandered her money. And no one could help me. Not even my mother, which I thought was the ultimate shelter. And a few years later, I saw my mother in the same situation, helpless. And there was no one in the world to help her. Now, a uh, few years later, <laughs> I did something which was... I was, by the way, a good boy. <laughs> I'm just telling all the bad things I did, so it may seem like I was a bad boy, but I, I wasn't. I was a good child. I was a good student. I was well behaved. But like every child, every once in a while, you do something <coughs> interesting. <laughs> uh, so a few years later, I did something. I'm not going to tell you what I did, but it was. It, uh, it made my mother super upset, made my grandparents super <coughs> upset, made the people of the whole town super upset. Even police was upset. <laughs> <laughs> and they were all looking for me. And I, I had an accomplice, we were two, two of us, a friend of mine and myself. And we were so scared. <coughs> The whole town was looking for us. They were all angry with us. And so what we did, we ran off into the hills. <laughs> we climbed up on a, on a hill and hid ourselves under a tree. And we decided to chant Hare Krishna until we die. <laughs> <laughs> We thought, this is the end of the world. We have just made everyone upset. This is not good. There is no, there is no going back. We shall just go up on this hill, sit under a tree, and we, we will chant Hare Krishna until we die. And we started. And then the friend of mine, he, as they say, chickened up. <laughs> <laughs> he returned to the town and told everyone where I was. <laughs> <laughs> and so not knowing what he did, I thought I was safe. And I just chanted there. And unlike ever before, even though I was in trouble to my, up to my neck, I for the first time experienced shelter. For the first time ever, that's why I remember this event, for the first time ever I experienced shelter. I was sheltered. I was secure. I was safe. I did not care whether I lived or died. I was so comfortable. I was so sheltered. Anything could have happened at that point. 
I would have been okay with just him, just about him, except them discovering me. <laughs> <laughs> and so when they discovered me, I was upset because they interrupted my chanting. I saw that be severely beaten, <laughs> but no punishment, nothing. They were just yelling at me a little bit, and everything was okay. But for the first time now, I experienced shelter. And so what my mother could not provide me, what my mother did not have, is what I now experienced in my early teenage. Actually, I wasn't even a teenager. I think I was 12, or maybe 13. Now, one more incident from my life, and then I'll stop with that. I was a soldier for a while. I was a soldier, and um, there I learned discipline and other things. Um, but I found myself to be a soldier during war times, and so I was in combat. Um, I was a I was a pacifist, so I, I locked my gun and I made sure I didn't hurt anyone, even by accident. But there were many situations there where people were shooting at us, where uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying everything in front of the children, but there were some really unpleasant situations, very, very unpleasant situations that would unsettle any mind. Some friends of mine uh, literally went insane due to the intensity of these experiences. And I, I felt just okay. I mean, I wasn't happy to be there, but I was completely protected from all of that. I was mentally sound. I was emotionally sound. And ultimately, I was even physically. For one reason, because I have discovered God. I have discovered Krishna, and I have specifically discovered Krishna in the form of the name of Krishna. In the form of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. <laughs> Since there's so many children here, I will not give you any details, but it was really intense. And I just sailed through it all, no problem. Because whatever happened, I would just give myself to Krishna. And I, I felt immediately It almost seemed that more intense a situation would turn, better I felt. <laughs> it's a paradox, apparently. Um, now, um, now children can all go to sleep or speak some philosophy with the exception of some. Uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes two types of reality. Two types of reality. Reality and then real reality. And I'll explain what I mean. So there's reality and then there's real reality. And you can all relate to this. Reality is that which we experience right now. And that which we're experiencing all the time. But what is then real reality? Because you see, everything that we think about can exist in reality and in more real reality this cup. There is a picture we could imagine, picture of the cup. 
And then there's the cup. And then there's a third form or way in which this cup exists. Let's say someone is thinking. If someone is thinking of the cup, then that cup is also there. And of all of these, we will say that one is more real than the other. Why? Or, if we think of a dream. <coughs> How many of you dream? <laughs> so, you can all relate. Those who didn't raise their hands, they will not be able to relate. <laughs> In the dream, we may have had experience of someone giving us a gift. And we might be very excited, and we completely experience the emotion. And then we wake up, and we say, oh, it was just a dream. But while we were asleep, it was very real. We have experienced it. The emotion was there, the gift was there, the person was there, everything was there. And so why do we then call the dream? Why do we then say, oh, it was just a dream? In other words, like there is no value to the dream. That's a question to you. Why do we not? give value to the dream then, especially to the gift we got in the dream. Yeah. Yes, it's not real reality, but why isn't real reality? We think it's an illusion. Yes, but why do we think it's an illusion? Because, because we can't see it physically. We can't see it physically, okay. That thing that was given to us. Very good. Excellent. We cannot retain it. In other words, there was a beginning to it, and there was the end to it. Please think about this. Please think about this. It had a beginning, and it had an end. And because it came to an end, after its end, we called it an illusion. Now, what was the thing, or what was the moment in this world that we have managed to keep? Has anyone here managed to keep a moment? No. Yes? Someone managed? <laughs> in your memory. Yeah, they're memory. gone. Yeah, it's gone. They're gone. They're in your memory, but they're gone. They're not here. That means that every moment in the future will have the same destiny. If we think of our own selves, our bodies will also have a beginning and have an end. But then we may ask ourselves, so what's the value to anything? There's only one way in which anything can have value. Can you think? What's the way in which anything can have value? Even though it's, there's, there's got to be one element to make anything valuable. And you sort of already said it. It can carry forward. It can carry forward. Forever. Forever. Thank you. Oh, you said forever? No, you just said forward. Yeah. So that now with these two we have it complete. So unless there is something which is eternal, that means everything we're doing right now 
in one point will have no value, <coughs> neither to you, neither to anyone else. Whether you're poor or rich, whether you're hungry or, or, or overeating, whatever your situation might be now, in the future will have no value. But there's one thing that would make it all have value. And that is that, in English, there's a word substance. What does the word substance mean? Something that matters, right. Okay. Yeah. Something that matters. Any other definitions of substance? What? Something you can feel. Something you can feel. Something you can feel. Okay, that's good too. Something you can feel. Something tangible. It's tangible, yes. Instead of intangible. And substance, this substance means that under the surface there is something which has, which has value. That which has value is under the surface. What is our face value? Our face value is European, Indian. <laughs> That's the face value. You expose it to the influence of time and nothing will be left of it. Not even the bow tie, in due course. Even though plastic is nearly eternal. <laughs> Almost eternal. It takes forever to disintegrate. So in our existence, that which really has value is that which is under the ever-changing surface. <coughs> there, there is the ever-changing surface. And then there is the base of it all that has value. And what is, what is that base? That's the eternal base. In ourselves, that is the soul, ourselves. The soul that stays through all the changes of the body. We could, maybe after the discourse, we could have children line up from, from the smallest one to the, and we can go to the oldest person in the room, so you can see the phases of time. <laughs> Similarly, as the soul is the constant in the body, it is the foundation of our existence. So also, Krishna and Krishna's name is the foundation of our existence. Everything else you will get and lose. But Krishna and Krishna's name is something that you're going to get to keep forever. I grew up in a Catholic country where way over 90% of people are Catholics. And so my parents, my grandparents, they're all Christians, Catholics. And when my grandmother was passing away from this world, she was getting seriously old, and it was obvious to everyone, including herself, that she did not have an awful lot of time left. And at that time, I was already a monk for 20 years or so. And I felt like I needed to tell her something, even at the expense of perhaps, even at the risk of perhaps agitating her mind a bit. So I first gave her a copy of the Bhagavad Gita, and to my great surprise, she took it. She wanted to read it, even though in her life she might have read one or two books only. She didn't even read the Bible, that's interesting. There's, well, there's a lot of people who never read Bhagavad Gita. Maybe even here. I hope not. <laughs> and then I asked her, just see, You used to have a husband. 
now in Adam heaven, because he passed away before her. Where is he now? Where are the times that you spent with her? I even asked her, where's your son? Because my father passed away. Before her. Where's your son? Where will you be? What do you have of it all? What will at the end be left there to, to exist? And this old woman, half educated, who in her whole life might have read one or two books, she started to think about it. And when I told her, look, grandmother, all you have ever had was God and your relationship with God. That was always constant. And when, you, when your body dies, that will be the only thing that you're going to be left with. So in other words, whatever, you, whatever efforts you have made throughout your life, whatever you might have accomplished, educated your children, your children may become president of, I shouldn't say, India or America. <laughs> Prime Minister of India. Prime Minister of Prime like Minister, the president of India. Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister of India. Or the President of America. <laughs> Even if you accomplish that, in due course of time, there will be nothing left of it. The soul, you, the only thing you ever had, and the only thing that at the end is left, is your relationship with God. So not only that Krishna is our shelter all throughout our existence, but Krishna ultimate, ultimately is the only shelter. Deha apatya kalatra dishu asma sanyesha satswapi tesham pramatanidanam pashyan akmina pashyati. This is the beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam. The person thinks, I'm fragile in this existence, but I have soldiers to protect me. Who are these soldiers? My healthy body will just wait. My wife, my husband, my children, my parents, my grandparents. But the Bhagavatam says, but, but these are only clay soldiers. Why clay soldiers? Because clay soldier only looks like a soldier, cannot do a thing. Whatever seems to be the shelter at the end will fail. At the end will fail. At the end everything fails. Teisham pramatanidanam. In this mad state, the person is thinking, person is seeing the demise of everyone and everything, and yet is not seeing it. It's going <coughs> on before all of your eyes, the demise. Your own very demise is going on. When you see your, your children growing, you're not thinking, oh, my little Johnny or my little Saraswati, she is two years closer to death. We're jolly. But if we boil down everything to material platform, it's a dark picture. But if you do know God, if you do know Krishna, and you do know the shelter, the ultimate, the only shelter, then you can be happy about your life. You can be happy about the lives of your children, provided you are teaching yourself and your children to take the shelter, the shelter, the only shelter, eternal shelter. Everything else will come and go. And at, at the end of the day, you will be left with literally nothing. Except the only thing you ever had. Like a friend of mine. He 
exchange from India, South India. And it was going to America. No, excuse me, to Australia, to be very specific. It was going to Australia. And his grandmother was very concerned. And he was a young, proud fellow. And his grandmother gave him a picture of Balaji. And he told him, this is your shelter. <laughs> he couldn't understand at the time. He put it in, in his wallet, only because his grandmother gave it to him. But later on, when the life started to get a little rough, I will not say all the details. It does not become obvious who this person is. But he found himself in a public bathroom in Australia, pulling out the picture of Balaji in the bathroom and praying. <laughs> and he felt, then he felt good. And then as soon as he came out, he ran into a, a devotee from Miskon who gave him a copy of Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> and it was very clear to me, Balaji sent me Bhagavad Gita. He had, it happened in such a serendipitous way that he had no doubt. And that's how he took to Krishna consciousness. Then, finally, after all those years, he could understand his grandmother, that his grandmother wasn't merely praying because of some ritual or the family tradition. But there was, she was making him realize. You see, this is the important thing. You may know about it, but if you're not doing anything for it, then you're not realizing it. What does it mean to realize something? This is just an English, question of English language. <laughs> what does it mean to realize? Two? What was it? Yes, very good. Yeah, you have so many good answers tonight. Thank you. <laughs> you have the highest score tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Last night is, it, it, was, uh, it was the kids, but tonight it's the adults, I guess. <laughs> um, to realize, to make real. In other words, Krishna is always there. God is always there, but if you're not doing something about that, your relationship with God, even though God is there, you do not have that shelter. So therefore, there is a, it's an interesting verse from the Srimad uh, Bhagavatam. Etavan Sankhya Yoga Vyam Svadharma Padinishtaya Janma Lava Parapumsa is anyone know the last line? Okay, then I won't say it because you probably speak Hindi and I understand it. I'm going to ask some questions. <laughs> so, Etavan Sankhya Yoga Vyana. Etavan means there's a conclusion, means sort of therefore. Therefore, something. All these verses that begin with Eta, Etavan, mean the introducing a conclusion. So, what is the conclusion? Sankhya Yoga Abhyam. By Sankhya or through Sankhya, through Yoga. Svadharma Parinishtaya. By performance of all of your Dharma. Janma Labha means upon gaining human birth. Parapumsa. The greatest thing, the greatest thing that can happen to a person is what? In other words, once you, have got, once you have found yourself in the human form of life, and you might have performed, you, have, you might have become proficient in Sankhya, which is a philosophy. You might have become proficient in Yoga. You might have performed all of your Dharma perfectly. But there is one thing that will make it all valuable. And that is ante at the end. Narayana smriti. Do you know what that means? 
Narayana Smriti. Remembering Narayana. So throughout our lives, we ought to remember God. So that we can at the end of life, remember God. And in this way we will have made the only shelter we always had real. Otherwise it's just a potential shelter. Potential means it's there, you can get it, but you don't have it. Potential. Therefore, in Krishna Consciousness, we teach the process of chanting of Hare Krishna. I'm not sure. Does that, does, how many of you here have a mala like this? Quite a few. How many of you use it? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> well, I'm not kidding, but you don't have to answer. You can answer that for yourself. So by daily chanting Krishna's names on this mala, what we're doing, we're making this shelter a reality. Otherwise, this shelter is just something that's written in the books of the Vedas, of Vedic literature. Or something that other people are experiencing, but not us. The Bhagavatam also says that with the rising and the setting of the sun, the lifespan of everyone, of everyone, is shortened. Except, does anyone know? Who's the exception? The one who's chanting. One who's chanting Hare Krishna. What does that mean? We see that when people chant Hare Krishna, they also get old. But the time does not have that devastating influence that whatever we do in our lives will be lost. But by chanting Hare Krishna, what we're doing, we're building our way into the eternal spiritual existence which is the goal of life. The soul does not belong to the material world. And as long as we don't make this journey, we're basically loitering in the material world. Even though we might be living in an expensive neighborhood, we're still loitering in the material world. So, I hope I was able to shock everybody enough. <laughs> Imagine that your intelligence for some reason uh, is malfunctioning one day. And you see a child, and you see the shape, everything, but you don't remember your child. There's no recognition. That is exactly the difference between mere experience and realization. Mere experience means that there is impression upon our senses of sound, form, touch, smell, etc but we're not recognizing. And now different people have different levels of recognition. The ultimate recognition is to see the temporary nature of everything and to see how all this is energy of Krishna. I'll give you an example. Kids, here's some magic for you. (laughs) 
This is a knot, right? It's a knot. You can see it? No, it's a knot. I mean, I just find it. A knot. You're watching carefully? <laughs> knot. There is no knot. Knot is not <laughs> anymore. Where did it go? It disappeared. It disappeared. I'm a good magician, right? <laughs> I'll show you later how to do this trick. So an ignorant person will only see the knot but will not see the substance behind the knot and will not understand the nature of the whole thing. So there is seeing, but the seeing power only goes so far. <coughs> so ultimately, ultimately, to see means to know, to realize, to be aware, to know, to recognize what's the nature of this existence, who am I, what's my relationship with this temporary plane, and what's my relationship with the permanent plane. Ultimately, what's my relationship with Krishna? So there is the difference between cognition and recognition, or ex mere experience and realization. Of course, we could add some more. Please, you want to say something? No. Uh, <coughs> feeling the person the dependence <coughs> is the state of a relationship, or could you say that again? Let's say, um, okay, I'm, when I'm helpless, I'm praying God, right? Mm. Is that experience is a self relationship? <coughs> uh, uh, so it could be my experience could be different from your experience, or your experience could be different. So there is no way I can. So, what is the what is the thing? Is, is that is a, a state of realization or how do Another reason why we consider installment <laughs> um, Another reason why we consider things we dream an illusion is because um, is because of the inconsistency. When there is consistency of experience, then we are more likely to believe that thing. So what my ex the experience I told is not only my experience, it's experience of literally billions of people. And that kind of consistency, in other words, that you can repeat the test, should tell us that there is reality to it. And so everyone can experience. It's not just my mere experience. Though there are, there are what we call subjective experiences, where two people are looking at the same thing and, and having a different experience. But that's also due to different states of consciousness. Even for God realization, for spiritual realization, it is required to be in a certain state of consciousness. Krishna says, uh, I don't show myself just to any fool. In other words, if one is foolish, and Krishna describes a fool, uh, if one is foolish, then uh, immoral, adharmic, etc., etc., then such a person will not see God even if he's in front of him. If you're familiar with Mahabharata, for example, Duryodhana saw the universal form of Krishna. Krishna showed him the universal form, a thing only God can do. And he still couldn't, couldn't get the point. He was still thinking, I will kill you and everybody else, and take all the land for me. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada gives the example of Two people, same situation. Situation is that something unpleasant has happened. Some kind of catastrophe we can imagine. 
And one person is thinking, oh, how bad this is. I shall take shelter of God. And the other person looks at it and says, oh, how bad this is. There is no God. <laughs> <laughs> Same situation. And so Prabhupada, then Shri Prabhupada asked the question, so what makes one person see God and the other one not? And specifically, the, this refers to punya. Or how do you say punya in English? You probably all understand the word punya, right? Piety. Depends on piety. And then there's different types of piety also. There's ultimately transcendental spiritual piety. <laughs> and so more pious a person is in their deed and consciousness, uh, more they will see <coughs> God. <laughs> it was a wonderful class, so that's why we didn't stop for a while. Thanks, okay. the time was over, but <laughs> oh, you should have <laughs> stopped because you also came there. Okay, I will just, if you don't mind, I'll yes. take one minute to uh, to tell you that there are some books of Ramayana available. These are in English. The, this is Ramayana retold, told in the form of a story following the original Ramayana as written in Sanskrit by my spiritual master, His Holiness Bhakti Vikasha Swami Maharaj. And in this one, this is the only Ramayana that's authentic, that uh, portrays Lord Ram as the Supreme Personality of God. This is the only Ramayana so far that actually does that, as far as I know. Um, also, even for your children, well, you're in America, so they're all probably speaking very good English, but it's also good for practice of English. My name, but anyhow, <laughs> just to throw that in. And so there's some in English, and there's some in Telugu, if you want. Uh, they are, you can contact you. Yeah. Okay. You can contact Mataji over here, and she can give you a copy. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
what is that people? So we're gonna all loudly raise our hands. God Premanande! Swami Maharaj for the wonderful, wonderful class and the amazingly ecstatic kirtan that took us all the way straight to Shishi Vrindavan Dam. So uh, thank you Maharaj for leading that ecstatic kirtan. Um, if you have not fulfilled your heart's desires of hearing Maharaj speak or hearing his kirtan, which I'm sure many of you have not yet reached up to the neck as Maharaj said, um, so please come tomorrow. Maharaj is only here for one more day in Austin. He's leaving tomorrow afternoon. He will be giving Bhagavatam class in Barron's Ranch, 2809 Stone, Stone, Stone Creek Place. Place, 2809 Stone Creek Place. It's at the house of Sanjay Prabhu, Meha Mataji, Mohit and Rishi. Uh, and I'm sure they will give you address. It's in Barron's Ranch, it's very close to Cactus Ranch Elementary School, so not too far from here. The program, the Bhagavatam class will start at 7 o'clock with Guru Puja and 7.30 is class. Yes, 7.15 7 7 Guru Puja and 7.30 we will be having class, so please try to join us tomorrow on making your Saturday a super spiritual Saturday. So we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow morning. morning. Yes, thank you. 7.15 a.m. Uh, we will do Arati, 7.30 a.m. in the morning we will start class. Thank you for explaining that. It's morning. Thank you. So tomorrow morning, please come and join us in hearing more from His Honest Bhakti and the Tirtha Swami tomorrow. Hi, Krishna.